Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Alex webinar, Using Oral History to Tell Your Family Stories. This webinar is presented as part of Preservation Week 2020. I'm Ian Muse. I'm a member of the Alex Preservation Outreach Committee, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Daniel Horowitz-Garcia. Daniel is a historian based in Atlanta, Georgia. His background includes 10 years experience in oral history in a variety of projects and 20 years experience in organizing at the local, state, and national level. Presently, Daniel serves as the regional manager with StoryCorps in Atlanta. He has an MA in history from Georgia State University. Before we get started, a few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to reduce background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. If you wish to comment on today's presentation using Twitter, you may use the hashtag shown on screen. We will have time at the end of the webinar to answer questions, and attendees are encouraged to post their questions for Daniel in the question box. Any questions that are not answered on air will be answered offline and the response is sent to all attendees. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. Now, here's Daniel. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. Okay, thank you very much, Ian. Um, my name my name is Daniel Horowitz Garcia, as as has been uh, uh, talked about. Excuse me, I'm just adjusting the audio a little bit. Um, and uh, you can just refer to me as as Daniel in any communication uh, if the name confuses you. Um, as Ian talked about, uh, I have about ten years background in oral history and uh, about 30 years experience in nonprofit work of various kinds, uh, 20 years of that organizing, both paid and unpaid. Um, but today we're going to be talking about oral history and the use of family stories um, and what you can learn from uh, the, the, the discipline of oral history and how you can use that, even if what you're doing is not going to be an oral history project. Um, as I said, uh, 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 as Ian said, I am the regional manager of StoryCorps in Atlanta. Um, and uh, I'll talk about that a, a little bit. Uh, for the last six years, I've been here in Atlanta, running the, the, the Atlanta booth. Um, for my title as the alternative historian is a, a title with triple meanings. meanings. Uh, I became a, a historian through an alternative path, and also my research focuses on counter-narrative, or the, it's also a play on alternate history because I'm, I'm a giant geek. Um, and if you want some, Here's some of my audio work. You can either go to alternativehistorian.com or the Change Over Time podcast, uh, where I use some oral histories I've cut into episodes and so on. So the goals I have for today are um, these four. I hope I hope they meet uh, everyone's expectations. Uh, I want you to feel comfortable in launching a small scale project. I don't expect that you're going to get everything you need to do in order to be able to launch a, a project, uh, but you'll be comfortable at least. Uh, with the scope of it and uh, be able to, to jump in. Um, I'd like to have a basic understanding of equipment necessary for capturing life stories, although I will tell you most of what we're gonna talk about is not equipment and, and you'll find out why. Um, I'd like you to understand that, that there are ethical issues in dealing with recording um, and uh, have an understanding of how you can begin grappling with that. Um, and then just other stuff around release forms and so on. Um, and that will uh, present itself when we get to the resource list at the end. Okay, so now what I want you to do is uh, just please take a look at these questions. And I want you to pretend that you are sitting across from a parent. Just really take some time now just to, to get into that space where you're sitting across from your mother or father or, or parent or just uh, a person that close to you. And when you're ready, I want you to mentally pick a question and picture yourself asking your parent or, or, or you know, caregiver that question. Um, I want you now to just think about the question you picked. Don't worry about imagining an answer. That's not, that's not the point of this exercise. Um, what I want you to focus on is what question did you pick? And ask yourself, why did you pick that question? Did you pick it because it was easy? Or did you pick it because it was difficult? 
did you pick it because it was really interesting or and then what was easy or difficult or interesting about the question now do the exercise again but suppose you were singing sitting across from a complete stranger let's say it's me we, we probably never met let's say you're sitting across from me what question do you ask me is it the same question if so why is it a different question if so why there are no right or wrong answers here. Um, the point of this exercise is to get you thinking about the dynamics of asking questions, uh, not the technical stuff like, yes, a question should be open ended and all that stuff. Not always, but it should um, usually. What I want you to focus on is, is the invisible stuff. Who are you talking to? And what is your relationship with this person? What kinds of questions does that relationship allow you to ask? And what kinds of questions does it not allow you to ask? Before you ever record your first interview, you should have, have some basic idea of who you're going to interview, why you're going to interview them, and what your relationship will make easy or difficult to talk about. That I think is, uh, regardless of whatever kind of project you're gonna launch, the, the, the discipline of oral history can help you in answering those questions and what to do from there. Um, so usually when people ask me about oral history, uh, they want to know about equipment, what recording device should I buy? And, and that's not necessarily a bad question, but honestly, it's the easiest one to answer. Uh, and we'll get there, but it's, it's really not that difficult to figure out what, what recording device you buy. 90% um, of your time on any kind of oral history project or, or, or project like oral history should be taken up by asking yourself the three questions I just mentioned, the who, why, and what is the relationship. The other 10% can be everything else. Um, I want you to think about that previous exercise. Now, what do you think would happen when you don't consider the relationship with the person you're interviewing or the reason behind the project, or you consider it, but you consider it poorly? Well, here's an example. These are in, um, uh, images from the Federal Writers Project. This was launched in 1935 as part of the Works Progress Administration. And the idea was to put writers to work. These writers did quite a bit of work, um, mostly writing about different parts of the United States. So you'll see in the middle of the WPA Guide to New York City, there were WPA, uh, WPA guides to all kinds of towns all, all across the United States. Um, they also did educational pieces. And on the right, Moments with Genius is an advertisement for a radio series. Um, and uh, a lot of them are very interesting and a lot of them are very used today. However, they also had another collection and this one has, has still has some controversy to it. Uh, you may be familiar with the WPA, what, what's collectively known as the WPA slave narratives. For two years, the Federal Writers Project spent time interviewing formerly enslaved people. And all in all, they interviewed about 3,500 people. Um, and this was between 1936 and 1938. So those 3,500 people represent 2% of all those um, alive who were born into slavery. So um, quite, quite, a, quite a large piece, I think. Uh, the youngest person they interviewed was still in their 70s, while 10% of all people they interviewed claimed to be more than 100 years old. And the point of that is to know that they were talking to people who had really long memory. You know, So think about something that you did you know 80 percent of your life ago um, and that's the kind of pieces the memories that they were that this project got but the end result of these are a bunch of interviews that are two to four pages long a remarkable few were recorded and most were not the the narratives were written up after the interview sometimes based on the interviewer's notes and sometimes just based on the interviewer's re recollections of the of the conversation and already i'm sure you can see the problem here uh, but more than that, uh, the fact that they were done after, the, uh, done after the fact, you can see some of the, maybe some of the nuances lost. And, and to be fair, the portable technology to directly record someone barely existed in 1960, 1936. It was expensive and it wasn't really portable. Um, I, I think a portable system probably would have been just a little bit smaller than a room in your house. Um, but the big problem here is not technology. Most of these interviewers were white Southerners, with, with the majority being um, white women. And none of the interviewers had received adequate training on how to interview people. 
most importantly, they didn't have a real discussion of what it meant to talk to someone born into slavery, living under Jim Crow, possibly on the land of the people who had enslaved them, and then ask them questions like, what did you think about your masters? So the biggest problem with the slave narrative is that the interviewers did not think about their social location, and they didn't think about their relationship with the people they were talking to. They didn't understand the relationship between themselves and the, 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 the narrator. Okay, that said, the collection is still valuable. There's a lot to be gained from reading the narratives, but mostly though, a single interview is gonna tell you a lot more about what a white Southerner felt about race relations in the 1930s than it's gonna tell you about what it was like to be enslaved in the century. So that gives you an idea of why it's important. And I wanna come now to just talking about oral history. What do I mean when I say oral history? And when I tell you this is a rabbit hole, I mean, Alice would be jealous of how deep this rabbit hole goes. We could spend the rest of our time just talking about what is oral history. Uh, but what I'm gonna talk about is just three criteria. Uh, I think that oral history encompasses a critical, critical engagement. Um, and it involves learning from those with direct knowledge. And it involves the creation of a primary source. And if it has those three pieces, it's oral history. What I mean by critical engagement with the past is um, you're talking to your grandma and grandma tells you she punched Hitler. And you think to yourself, okay, grandma really punched Hitler. Where was grandma in relation to where Hitler was? And you figure out whether or not there might be some discrepancies between what grandma said and the actual historical record. Um, learning from those with direct knowledge of the past is I'm gonna talk to the person who says they punched Hitler. And the creation of a primary source, this is where things are very different than other types of projects. Your project does not have to be an oral history project. If you want to make sure your grandmother's stories are recorded for future generations, that's great. We don't have to have a debate about whether it's an oral history project or not. But the point of this seminar is to uh, help you realize that the practice of oral history involves some insight in the project even if, or especially if, it's because you want to record your grandma's stories. And that has to do with a third part of the criteria, the creation of a primary source. If you sit down and record grandma talking about the time she punched Hitler, then grandma is a co-creator of that interview, that audio. The product of an oral history, the product of sitting down and doing that recording is a primary source created by the interviewer and the storyteller or narrator or subject. The source is the recording. Any transcript you do is going to be an interpretation of that source. The piece that there's no wiggle room around is that the person you're talking to is a co-creator and they have certain rights and you have ethical duties that you don't if you use a different methodology. And that's really important to consider. At the Oral History Association, um, you know, we take ethics uh, extremely seriously. And from the OHA, the Oral History Association. Uh, you may be legally allowed to record someone without their knowledge. That depends on what state you live in. I live in Georgia, and I believe it's legal for me to record somebody else, even though they don't know I'm recording it. But ethically, there's just, you, you aren't. So the question is, should you? Well, when I said ethically, there is some context that should be made. If you're trying to gain evidence on a band of smugglers, yeah, sure, go ahead, record without their consent, without their knowledge. But if you want to save grandma's stories, no, absolutely not. You need to think about those ethics. You need to think about what's going on. Um, so why do you plan on recording someone? If you can answer that question, it helps a lot with any and all ethical questions that flow from that. Even if, you're, even if your project is not an oral history project, the ethical standards of oral history, um, as the statement from the OHA shows, can be really helpful to you. Um, so one of the pieces I really want to um, uh, pull from this is because of those ethical obligations, the standard within oral history, history is informed consent, that the person knows what they're doing. Uh, and so that means a higher level of explanation, really explaining to grandma, this is what's going to do. This is what I'm doing. This is what you're going to happen to your story after I'm done. You need to be able to have answers to those questions. And that brings us back to my earlier advice. Who are you recording? Why are you recording them? What does your relationship allow 
or not allow for discussion. Because when grandma realizes that everything she's talked about may be in an archive and available for public viewing, she may not want to say all the stuff about what your uncle did when he was 17 years old. Maybe she does, you know, but it's up to her. She has to know that's that informed consent. That's why um, uh, it's a high standard that needs to be met. So to help me with this, some questions to ask before you begin your, your project. The big one um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of surprised people don't ask more often is what, why are you recording? I want to record grandma's stories. Why? What is it about the stories? What is it you want to do? And if you can answer that question, you go a long way to figuring out what happens in the rest of your project. If the story is, um, I need to record this because grandma's 90 years old and my kid is two and I want my child to know what her great grandmother sounded like. That is really different than um, I want to write a book. You know? uh, but think about why are you recording? Think about who do you want to listen to the recording? Is this just for your family? Uh, is this going to be just for the archive? Just as in quotes, air quotes there. Um, is this for your podcast or television show? Uh, answering this question can tell you a lot about what kind of project you're doing and what to emphasize, emphasize, excuse me, uh, emphasize as well as what um, uh, type of paperwork and other pieces you're going to need for that informed consent um, and what kind of uh, work you're going to have to do on that paperwork on the back end. And what do you want the audience to do with this information? Uh, this is important because if you're just creating something for future historians, again, just as in air quotes, um, that means you just really need to prepare for the archive. Maybe you need to do an index. Well, at least you can do an index. Probably you need to do a transcription. If Can you afford to do that? Um, if you just want your, your kids to be able to hear their great grandmother's voice, you probably don't need to transcribe it but you do need to make sure that they can hear that voice and understand it. Um, that also helps answer that question of where is this recording gonna live when you're done? Uh, if this is something for future historians, then you're gonna have to archive it. And, and frankly, I believe if you don't archive it, it's not oral history. It could meet everything other, other criteria, but if you don't archive it, it's not critical engagement with the past. Um, and therefore it's not oral history. But if it's not oral history, you still need to have some plan. Where is this going to live and who's going to make sure it's okay? Okay, now we get onto the recording equipment. The kind of recording equipment you need really is dependent on mostly what you have, what's your budget, and then a little bit on um, what do you want to do. But your recording equipment could be any of this. Um, oops, excuse me. Now, for some of you younger folks, you may not have any idea what that um, uh, Sony in there is, but there used to be this thing called cassette tape. Um, we don't do that anymore. Uh, but the fact is, if you have a laptop or a, a, um, a, a cell phone, you probably have all the equipment you need in order to be able to do a really good um, uh, oral history project or oral history light project. The, the Honestly, the first real case that I know of of portable technology goes back to 1945 when uh, Dr. David Broder, um, who was a psychologist, went to Europe after World War II and interviewed uh, concentration camp survivors. Uh, he did it so soon after the end of World War II, so this is, excuse me, more like 46. He did it so soon afterwards that um, people did not have the name concentration camp yet. Uh, or uh, death march hadn't been coined yet, let alone terms like genocide. So he, he had 60 pounds worth of equipment that he could fit into the Jeep. And it was amazing at the time that it could all fit into one Jeep and he could drive around Europe and interview people. Uh, the quality of those in recordings are by today's standards abysmally low. Uh, but the fact is you can go up into the 1970s and they're still not all that great. But now with uh, prices of everything dropping. I'm, I'm, I have three microphones uh, within arm's reach of me right now, and all totaled, I think that's less than $500 worth of equipment. So th those kind of prices haven't been seen ever before. So if you have, it, it is possible to get really good equ equipment fairly cheaply, but it also depends on what you're going to do with it. Um, if you plan on using this in a radio show or podcast or television, you're quality is going to have to be much higher than if you just want to make sure that the kids can hear grandma's voice. Even still, my general sense is if you're going to record somebody, then um, it's probably a better idea to 
do the best you possibly can. Uh, get the best quality you can. You're going through all this work, you're going through all this time, all this effort, why not record the best you possibly can record? Um, now, that said, I, I don't want you to put technology before people. You could have a, a really wonderful microphone, but if you don't know how to use it, or if it's beyond you, or you haven't spent that much time thinking about it, then you're wasting, you've wasted your money. This is a nod to Studs Terkel. Uh, any of you from Chicago or any public radio geeks might have heard of Studs Terkel. He was on the air for or for quite some time. He, he wrote some many books, particularly one about um, the Great Depression and and just on working life uh, that um, in the oral history field or memory field or, uh, did surprisingly well. Uh, but Studs was a technical klutz. Uh, there is recording of Studs just not talking into the microphone, but then not passing it over so that the other so it's pointed at the other person. So you can hear studs very well, but you can't hear the person he's interviewing at all. Um, so it's really wonderful to have great technology. If you don't know how to use it, then uh, you're not doing yourself any favors. Um, but if you have a really high quality mic and you do know how to use it, it's still not going to save you if you don't know why you're talking to this person. You still have to figure out um, what is it you're talking about. A microphone is not going to substitute for a good question. Um, and then lastly, I just keep coming back to this one question. Everything really kind of flows off for, from it. Why are you doing the recording? Do you just need it for your notes? Do you need it for the archive? Do you need it for broadcast? And once you have that answered, then um, a lot of your technology falls away. Um, and, but the reality of oral history is that most folks don't have a giant budget for it, uh, that most things are just done on a shoestring, and the technology you use is whatever technology you happen to have at the time. So there is a saying in oral history, it's called the Halitosis School of Oral History, that uh, bad breath is better than no breath. It's better to do a bad recording than no recording at all. So uh, in general, I would say go with you, what you have. If you have a, a laptop and a cell phone, those would probably be your first choice. Okay, let's talk more about technique now. You realize you're going to talk to, to uh, grandma and you want these, um, you want to get um, her stories, right? Uh, but I want you to think now about a good storyteller. Who is the best storyteller in your family? And what makes them a good storyteller? I think, this is from my experience of StoryCorps, that everyone has wonderful stories. Everyone on this planet has wonderful stories, but not everyone is a natural storyteller. A good story has a beginning, a middle, an end, and a reflection. And most people tell a story by starting in the middle, and then they stay there. So that means if someone, chances are the person you're talking to, is not a natural storyteller, and that, so that means you're going to have to do the, a lot more work to get the story out because they have a wonderful story. If they are a wonderful storyteller, your only job is to hit record and let them go. Make sure you hit stop. It happens. It happens maybe, I would say, one in every couple hundred, couple maybe a thousand interviews. Um, but sometimes you get someone who's just a natural at it. Even still, you can get someone who is so fixed in their particular narrative that they will on, they only tell you the way the story is told and not the other juicy bits, right? So these back pocket questions are little things you kind of keep in order to make sure you can get that beginning, middle, end, and reflection. This painted picture in words, again, if people start a story in the middle, I was out, you know, that, so Bob and I were out doing stuff. The, the idea of to tell them to stop and paint a picture in words of paint a picture in words of Bob. Who is Bob? What did Bob look like? Well, Bob was six foot tall and he was tattooed on the left side of his body. He could never get enough money to tattoo the right side. Those are the kind of descriptors that you need in order to make the story come alive. But what happened next is just a good way to keep people chronologically. Uh, it, your recording does not have to be chronological. Don't get wedded to that. But to have someone think about it step by step can be very useful. The tell me more, if somebody says, you know, Bob and I were out, well, tell me more, what does out mean, you know? So things like, what is the turning point and how did it change you? This is the reflection. In my experience, getting people to move to the reflection is really difficult. The reflection is, what was the more, what's the moral of the story? What did you learn? 
what was the turning point in your story? How did this, how did doing this change, change you? Um, people don't always think about that, or if they do think about it, they may have the, the thing in their mind that's, that, that is the moral, no matter what. Um, so in your story, in your interview, if you want to get grounded a little bit, you know, what I learned is never try to go tell cow tipping by yourself. And oh, well, really, is that the, so what was the turning point that made you decide that? What, how did going out by yourself, you know, change you or whatever? And what you really learned is, you know, find what they're really saying is the reflection is friends are important. So having this list of these back pocket questions is just a way to kind of fill out the, 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 the interview a bit. Um, when you sit down to do an oral history, it's work and you should approach it in that vein. Okay, so how to prepare a little bit on how to plan your project out. Every, if you haven't done your project yet, now is the time to figure out is what is your goal? Where are you going to record? And how are you going to get your narrators ready? How are you going to get the people ready? The where are you going to record is important. Um, most of us don't have studios, although you may be lucky enough to live in a, a community that has um, a, a public library that has podcast studios, you may be able to use that. Uh, nowadays, uh, it's going to be impossible to go to someone's house, particularly if you're talking about an elderly person, you're, you're taking a risk I would not advise. Uh, so how are you going to do this? We are going to do it over the phone. Um, there are pluses and minuses to that. Um, you also should decide uh, how are you going to record? Is it going to be video or is it going to be audio? I personally only do audio. I do audio only because I just don't. I'm not a video person. Um, so, so where are you going to, if you are going to somebody's house, most people like to record in the kitchen. I can tell you the kitchen is the worst place to record. If you think about a house, where does everybody go? Everybody goes to the kitchen eventually. Uh, it's very loud. Sometimes you just have to do it because most folks don't, most folks, at least I've talked to, don't have a separate den or library. If you do go to the kitchen, do what you can in order to uh, reduce the noise of everything. And there are little tricks you can do, like unplug the refrigerator and then leave your car keys inside the refrigerator. Um, that way you can remember to turn it back on. You don't want to owe somebody's groceries. Okay, and then getting ready for the interview. Um, the back pocket question's already talked about. The top is the fall of the good stuff. Uh, at StoryCorps, we advise people to come up with a list of 10 to 15 questions. It's a 40 minute conversation. So we advise them to come up with a list of questions together. The questions you come, topics you come up with, you should be doing it with your uh, uh, narrator together. Um, this is work on their part as well. Think about it, if you're gonna, if you were to come up to me and say, I'm gonna interview you about work you did in 1994, I would need a minute to figure out you know, just go back. I know I was alive in 1994, but where was I and what was I doing? I'm gonna need some time to figure that out. Um, so you're gonna come up with this plan. If you're gonna do a larger piece, I would move away from questions and more towards topics, um, but don't be so wedded to your plan that you, for, that you neglect the good things people talk about, all that follow the good stuff. So if you're there to talk about some, uh, uh, immigration and um, they are talking about yes we came from uh, you know Eastern Europe at this time and and we came into New York and but that was a year that was about a year after we got abducted by the aliens and the, once they say that I would really hope that you would write on your notes aliens and then come back to that um, if somebody gives you something a good story but it wasn't on your notes follow it, follow the good stuff, something will come for it. And then the push for reflection, those back pocket questions are important. What did people learn about it? What happened, not just the what happened, but how did they feel about what happened? Um, and then lastly, the, the idea of the two ears, one mouth is, uh, you know, you, you, the, you, the equation of how much you should listen versus how much you should talk should follow that ratio. And then lastly, just because the, uh, the, the, um, the interview is done doesn't mean your work is over. So the, the I heard this at my first Oral History Association conference, and I love it. Get thee to a coffee house. The, the second your interview is done and you say goodbye and you've done your thank yous, uh, get someplace where you can do a data dump of everything that happened. Um, this is mostly important. If you're talking to grandma, uh, then where was the interview done? Uh, make sure you write in, in the cover to this interview that you are the grandchild. 
uh, it's quite possible that a grandmother would not tell her grandchild certain things she would tell somebody else. Um, I can tell you that uh, over the year, decades, every time I've asked my mom about how her and my dad met, the story has, hasn't changed, but it has gone into a level of detail that I didn't know before, and I don't think I was ready when I was 20. I don't think I'm ready right now, but she told me anyway. At any rate, so get to a coffee house and dump all of that. If you're talking uh, to a neighbor, then um, get the out down of this is what all the stuff that the information on in the context of the interview. Um, and like I said, this is could be a little bit more if you're doing, you know, as, as a professional oral historian, if I'm talking to somebody uh, and their boss is present, I need to go ahead and make that inter uh, that information. I have to note that information because it's going to impact how people read that interview or listen to that interview in the future. Send a thank you. Uh, make copies. Just make a lot of copies. Um, I would say really the number of copies you need to make are one in your hard drive, one in, on an external hard drive, um, and then one in the cloud. An external hard drive, one that's not at your house, so if there's a fire, it, it survives. Uh, don't make the copies unless the person you've talked to is okay with it, though. Um, so this has to go back to prepare for the interview. Make sure they know that what your plan has to include making copies. Are they okay with that? They might not be okay with it until they've listened to it or until they have um, read the transcript or something. Um, but make sure that whatever you do with it, that the person you've interviewed uh, is okay with that. And then lastly, archive it. I think archiving is, is really important. Um, and you should think about where you're going to archive it before you do your interview. Um, and ways to kind of to go ahead and do that. Um, it could be as easy as if this person is an alum of a university, maybe the university would take it. Uh, if this person was in a union for you know, 20, 30 years and retired, perhaps the union's uh, papers are, are uh, archived somewhere and so on. Those kind of things can help a bit. Uh, I've included here a little bit of resources. All of these different um, sites have something to offer. The Oral History Association is kind of catch-all. If you can only figure out one place to go, I would go to oralhistory.org, where you can get a lot of resources and clips on everything from uh, samples of release forms or at least click links to where you can get samples of release forms, um, all the way to uh, the Vermont Folklife Center and Transom are places to go if you need help with technology. And then Ask Doug is uh, from Doug Boyd, who is a former um, president of the Oral History Association. He uh, has a lot of advice on, uh, well, a lot of technical advice on what kind of microphone or recorder you should use, but also just a lot of advice on um, um, how to do an oral history. And if you're gonna do 10 hours of research, I would really make nine hours of it about how to set up the project and, and think about your project. The other two are the Oral Historian's Digital Toolbox, or just things you can put on your computer that can help make life a little easier for you when, when you're doing oral history. And then, of course, StoryCorps. Uh, the StoryCorps has a list of great questions um, that are divided by category of based on 16 years of folks talking to each other. And they could be uh, an idea of topics and um, uh, where you can kind of go from that. Uh, and I am uh, available to answer questions right now. Um, if you don't get to your question or can't think of one immediately, I am happy you can just send me an email and I will get to you um, when I can. Uh, thank you all so much for the time. I appreciate it and uh, good luck on your project. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> this has been a very interesting session. Uh, since we have time for questions, uh, if you have not yet done so, please type your questions into the question box. We already, we already have a few to get us started. So the first question is, um, what format should thank yous be written on? Uh, paper, text, email? What do you recommend, Daniel? I recommend not putting yourself on mute until you're done talking. <laughs> um, I, uh, I think that just depends on the person you're talking to. I, I've done stuff with uh, narrators that an email was fine. Um, and then, or tech. I've done others, especially with some older folks who, are, who I had a much more formal relationship where it, it had to be, you know, I just hand wrote something and stuff. So that just depends on the nature of the relationship. Okay. Um, could you clarify uh, why it is not, uh, 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 why if it is not archived, it is not oral history? 
Well, that goes back to the first piece I said about critical engagement with the past. And if it's not archived, then um, how is somebody else going to check your work? You know, if I do, if I write an article and I cite an interview, but nobody else can look at that interview, then um, my citation of it is it loses weight, in my opinion. Um, if somebody can go back, look at my citation, find the original and say, yeah, but you neglected that whole first half of the sentence um, and it changes the context, uh, then what we're doing, then we're actually doing history. So if it's not archived and people don't have, and, of, and scholars, um, whether in academia or out of it, don't have access to it, then I don't think it's critical engagement with the past. Great, thank you. Um, do you have suggestions for mixing oral history with present day questions, especially about COVID life? Uh, do you think it's appropriate to ask both about the present and past, in other words? Wow, that's, well, in history, the, like the worst thing you could be called is a presentist, right? So that that is kind of a, a stigma to oral history about we're too focused on, on, on the present, it's not real. But um, I think that also depends on context. Um, I f the, the reality is when you're talking somebody to someone, regardless of when you're talking to them, you are both in a context at that time. So their answers to their questions are going to be dictated by that context. So if you interview someone about um, war and it's 1968, it's going to be a different answer than if you interviewed that same person in 58 or in 78 or in 88 or in 98. Um, th their experiences in World War II are gonna be, their answers may be different based on what's happening geopolitically. Um, so the, the other piece to think about that, though, is what is, does it make sense to do oral history about some ongoing trauma? And that is a debate. Um, there are some serious questions to ask, I think, about one, um, is it necessary to do this right now? If we don't do this right now, uh, what happens? Do we lose it? Is it gone forever? Uh, if we do this right now and it's gone forever, but we do great harm, is it worth it? Um, and thinking about those framing questions are important. Uh, I think some folks think about talking and talking about their as inherently healing. And I would encourage everyone not to think about, not to think about it that way. So telling your story is not necessarily in it, is not inherently healing. It might be healing for you, or it could be harmful. Um, telling your story is like fire. Fire can be very useful. Fire can keep you warm and it can cook your food, but fire can also burn your house down and destroy your family. Um, so it's important to think about uh, the power and what is happening with that power of the story. Um, and are you do, is it possible to do more harm? Is it possible to do great good? And that is also a conversation to have with um, uh, the, the, the potential narrators. There's a lot of scholarship that's being done about trauma in oral history. Uh, and I think that all kind of flows together. I wouldn't discount doing something about talking to folks about survival on COVID-19, but, um, you know, my grandmother lost her father uh, during the flu epidemic in 1918. So talking to her about COVID-19 could bring up a lot for her that, uh, wouldn't necessarily be true to my mom or to someone else. Uh, so I would need to really, really think about that before I started talking to her about it. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, um, here's another question. If the interviewee is long-winded, uh, do you try to keep it under 40 minutes or do you let it, do you let it go on as long as possible? Uh, how do you avoid going too long without losing good insight? Well, that, that also depends on the context. The 40 minutes is for story core interview. Um, so if, it, if the person is in the story core booth with a friend or family member having a conversation, they have about 40 minutes. Um, so it's easy to cut them off because we got somebody else who needs to come in the booth right after that. So it's like, you got five more minutes, you're done. But if it's an oral history interview uh, that I do with other folks, um, those are typically long, much longer than that. They're, I'll do hour and a half sessions. Um, I find that I personally can interview somebody for an hour and a half before I get tired and need to take a break and stand up and walk around a little bit. Uh, and uh, most of the people I interview also need to take a, a bit of a break. Um, I have colleagues who interview folks for you know, maybe three hours at a stretch. Uh, I, I couldn't do it. I need about an hour and a half. If a, if a person you're talking to is long-winded, 
um, then the 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 question for me, if it's not a interview, if it's just a regular interview I'm doing, then uh, what are they telling me? Is it important? Um, are they talking a lot about stuff that is important, or are they talking a lot in order to avoid the important stuff? Um, then um, the question then becomes, you know, uh, th then it becomes a strategy. If I have a lot of times with um, oral history uh, pieces, I may interview, I will interview a person more than once. And so the first time I may just let them talk and get it all out. And then once we build a stronger relationship, the, the second or third interview, then I will direct more. Okay. We have a lot of great questions here. Uh, the next one uh, here in the, in the list is, Somebody says they they've heard they've heard the term living history used in relation to oral history. Uh, living history and how does it compare to oral history? Well, I think. Well, there's a joke about the Oral History Association conference that uh, the only theme in an oral history association conference is what is oral history, and it's been like that for fifty something years now. So, um, and and part of that is um, this started as a re research methodology and now maybe can be considered as a discipline. Uh, so there's a lot of different pieces going on and it's experiencing a bit of a heyday. Like if you did a Google search on oral history right now, you would find you know, the oral history of the uh, uh, Atlanta Falcons loss to the Patriots in the Super Bowl. And I have a hard time thinking that's really an oral history. It, it looks to me more like a, an interesting article, but not where somebody interviewed a bunch of people, but not necessarily uh, an oral history. I mean, that said, you know, if I wanted to be a, if I wanted to patrol borders, I, I would have worked with, I would have become a border patrol agent, right? So um, the idea of, I think it's more important to think about those three criteria, honestly, um, about, you know, the critical engagement with the past, uh, about are you talking to somebody with direct knowledge, um, and see than it is to come up with a strict definition. So. If you're talking to somebody with direct knowledge and you're critically engaging and you're creating a primary source, then I think you're hitting all the ethical and um, uh, methodological, methodological pieces that I think you need to hit. Um, I, I could also be flip and just say like all history, all, all history should be living since um, it, it changes based on new knowledge and, and, and all and pieces. But for the purposes of, you know, what you're going to do on the ground, I think it's more important to focus on the criteria and um, and make sure that you're building a solid project from the ground up. Great. Um, here's, a, here's a very practical question. Uh, what are some special considerations uh, you might have for interviewing older people who have become hard of hearing? A sick close. <laughs> uh, I, I actually interview a lot of older people who, who are hard of hearing. Um, and that is, um, you can just adjust the microphone and stuff, but you, to make sure that you, you can hear that if you shout to the other person, but you don't adjust your microphone very well, all you're going to get is, you know, these high peaks that flatten out and, and, and you won't be able to hear yourself in the audio. But you can adjust, adjust it and just speak loud enough, get close, make sure you're in a really quiet place, those kind of pieces. Um, I would be very intentional about the environment in, in those places, someplace quiet, um, maybe someplace where, uh, think about the lighting. Um, if the lighting is softer, uh, then people's hearing can go up a little bit. So um, someplace with a comfortable place with soft lighting that is very quiet. Um, and then sit close, sit as close as uh, their comfort level and yours will allow. Um, if they can't hear you, you're not going get to get a great interview no matter what. So it is very important they can hear you. Okay. Um, here's, a, here's one. Are there, are there any particular themes we should consider uh, to get grandma to open up about things she, she wouldn't ordinarily talk about? Uh, the big theme is your relationship with, you know, with grandma. Um, there are certain times when I think only a family member can ask about something because they're a family member. And there are other times when only a non-family member can ask about something because they are not a family member. So there have been more than a few times at, at a story core where I have sat down from somebody who just lost a parent uh, within the last year, and they are talking to me as a stranger because they cannot, they don't have the Amer uh, emotional wherewithal to talk to a family member, but they do want to talk. So if you're talking to your grandma, it may be that there are certain things that you're just not going to get to because you're the grandchild. 
but it may also be that because you're the grandchild and not the child, there are other things that you can talk to, talk about. Um, you should think about it. Um, and if it's a theme you're interested in, uh, in the pre-interview, make sure that you talk to grandma about, you know, I would like to talk about your first divorce or um, I understand, you know, you had a child that you lost. Maybe we can talk about that. And grandma may say absolutely not, or she may, um, may be okay with it, or she probably will need some coaxing. Usually what I find though, most of the time, is people say, my story is not that very interesting. I have nothing that you really wanna hear. So most of my time is spent convincing people that they actually have something that I wanna hear and could be really useful uh, to the archives. Uh, so honestly, that's probably gonna be your, your big piece. Um, but in that pre-interview, when you sit down and talk with grandma, you should bring up what it is you wanna talk about and just lay it on the table. And if she's adamant and says, no, no, that's not something I would talk about, then um, you know, remember she's a co-creator. She's your partner. Um, would you go into a project with a partner who's adamant about not doing something and then force them to do it? What would that partnership look like? And what would the end of result of the project look like? Um, it probably wouldn't be great. Um, so that is to think about. Uh, in a practice interview I did years and years ago, I had to interview my mother-in-law where I talked about her, uh, a piece about her job. And it was very clear in order to do the assignment, I had to push her to a place where it, she was gonna be very upset. And I came in to my uh, professor and I handed in the stuff and said, I didn't get where I needed to get in this interview because I'm not making my mother-in-law upset. I love my mother-in-law and it's just not gonna happen. Um, and he said, congratulations, you passed, right? You know, like uh, you, um, you need to, figure out what the, what the landscape is, and then uh, create a strategy that works for both you and your subject. Well, great, yeah. Um, so uh, the next question somebody asked, um, are, the, are the thank you messages that you, that you uh, follow up with, uh, do they become part of the archival record? No, not usually, not usually. At least mine don't. Mine is just, hey, thank you for your time. I appreciate that. If I have follow-up questions, or if I want clarity, um, that would be a note that I would include into the record. You know, like you mentioned, you know, Tom, was it Tom, T-O-M or T-H-O-M? You know, that kind of stuff. I would just create a note that has that kind of pieces. But if it's a, uh, thank you so much, I appreciate the time we had together, uh, and uh, yada, 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 sincerely, then that doesn't have to be part of the record. Okay, that, that actually kind of leads us to the next question in some ways. Uh, what metadata is important to record? I guess about the subject and the and the the situation. Yeah, that's that is important. That um, I would think of a lot of different keywords that you talked about. So some of the resources that are in my resource list will get you to a place where you can kind of think about it um, and think about the different subject. Basically, I would think about when you open up a book and that page that has the copyright and all the Library of Congress information. Think about that. When you think about the interview, what are those different subjects from the Library of Congress that fit into your interview? And I usually come up with those uh, multiple times. The first time is when I get to a coffee house and I do the data dump and I can think of the big subjects. But then if I do something like an index, and for those who, who don't know, a transcript is when is a, a word for word interpretation of the interview. An index is more of a collection. So a transcript will say exactly what people said at a certain minute. An index will say between minute one and minute two, people talked about this. And that's important because people can talk for 30 minutes about segregation and never use the word segregation. They'll just say the white people lived on this side and the black people lived on that side. And every, you know, both of you know you're talking about segregation, but the word segregation has never come up. So an index would say between minute one and minute five, so-and-so talked about segregation. And when I do that, then I know, uh, well, obviously segregation is metadata. I need to put that in. So I'm con I, I agonize over tags. Um, so I constantly go through. Uh, my general sense is more tags are better than less. OK, great. Um, There's another good practical question. Uh, how do you transcribe uh, uh, when, the, when the stories are recorded on your cell phone? Uh, well, first off, I, I try not to do transcription. I can't stand it. I mostly work from indexes. But uh, if you do record on, a on your cell phone, um, there is a way that you can plug it into your computer and pull the WAV file off. Um, so you would just need to pull the file off your phone, get it into a computer, and it'll be a WAV file.wav. Um, and WAV is the standard in which we 
we save oral histories for the most part. Try not to save as an MP3. Like, uh, an MP3 is compressed. It's a much smaller file. A wave has, it's a bigger file. A 40 minute conversation can run 500 megs. Um, so if you talk for an hour and a half, you're gonna you know, have, have quite, a big, quite a big file, smaller than if you did video, but still. Um, but you'll, you'll have that wave file. The wave is really your standard. Um, all that rich um, audio information is gonna be in your wave. But you can just pull that off your cell phone. Um, if you do something like StoryCorps has an app where if you download the StoryCorps app, a lot of this is all kind of taken care of and you can upload it to the archive. But even still, um, it's just based on the, the voice recorder app on your phone. So it'll just live as a either a wave or sometimes an AUP or something, but it just lives as a file on your phone. If you plug it in USB in your laptop, you can pull it off. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, this this next question I think is interesting. Um, is doing oral history something that you recommend teens doing to preserve their family history, or should they wait until they're adults to to do so? Uh, I would say if you're interested, you should just do it. Uh, I don't. The thing about I think anybody can do it. StoryCorps has um, a piece called the, the Great Thanksgiving Day Listen. Uh, where during that Thanksgiving weekend, uh, teens are encouraged to talk to their elders uh, and just record stuff on the app. Um, and we also get, I get a lot of, of um, requests from different schools about, you know, so-and-so is going, my class is going to do peace and I want them to do, you know, talk to elders and so on. Um, so I would encourage them to do it. Uh, I, I think if they're teens, they need to have some adult guidance. Like I said, um, telling stories is a type of is there's power in it, and it should be think that think think about it as fire. So if you're okay letting your 14 year old play with fire unsupervised, then yeah, by all means. But um, uh, I would say uh, it's fine for them to do, but they really need to have um, an adult supervising. Um, it's not uncommon, for instance, to have it's not super common, but it's not uncommon uh, to have to be interviewing someone and then especially the, the person just talks about an assault right in the middle of it and they had no plan on talking about it but suddenly it kind of came out in the moment uh and that can be really difficult to deal with um for an adult i don't know how a teen would do it um so in that respect i, I that's not to say that I, yeah i think teens should do it i think it'll be fine but they really need to have a, an adult um supervising the project okay Great. Um, next, next, we have a good uh, procedural question. Uh, when interviewing elderly parents with the goal of recording their full life, is it a good idea to begin uh, the questions from early childhood and, and sort of move forward from time with each interview? Um, yeah, well, if I think it's a good idea to make sure that each time you sit, you're, you're talking about a section of their life. You can begin whenever you want. I don't necessarily do life stories for the most part. So I don't really record like the, the, the arc of someone's life. I mostly focus on, you know, like the work that kind of, most of my research focuses on social movement. Um, so I talk about the organizing people did or the act folks did, but I still need to get the background. So I still will begin about where were you born, how were you raised and so on. So that can be an easy way to begin any interview. Um, so you can be just, you know, your first interview is just tell me where you were born, where you were raised, what was family life like and everything. That's an easy way to, do the interview. You don't have to do that. If you find that it's easier for somebody to talk about what they did just before they retired, then you can go ahead and do that and get back to it later. Um, it might be helpful to go chronologically, uh, but you don't have to. What I would recommend though is uh, if you're going to do a full life's history, that uh, you break this up into pieces. You know, an hour and a half talking about until they got to high school maybe, and then high school to to college and then work a bit about work life and then more about work life and then later on and so on and, and just break it break it up in those different topics because it can be a lot um and uh you can end up skim skipping a lot just because you have if you feel this need to get to it all you can end up skipping a lot so uh start wherever you and the narrator are most comfortable um but just make sure to break it up okay um and the next question uh is do you ever edit an oral history uh, if the person you interviewed asks you to take some portion, some blurb out of out of the the interview? Is that something uh, that you would do? There are uh, conditions that I allow the the narrator to do, so I won't change something. So can you just edit that out so I sound better? 
you know, is not something I would do. But if they say, you know what, I talked about my my brother for these 15 minutes and we're estranged, but I don't want him to, I don't want to be estranged and I just don't want to run the risk they'll ever hear that. I want that deleted. I would allow that. I would delete that in the original file and uh, but I would leave a note that's saying so you know time stamp this to time stamps that deleted at narrator's request due to sensitive content. Okay. Um, next question we have, and I think we're getting through, this may be our last question. We may have time for one more, but uh, this one is, uh, are there any techniques for getting more information out of someone who is not warming up to the experience or maybe they're very tense? Well, uh, time is a good one, right? So if somebody's very tense, then, um, then uh, a little bit more time. I would have them start, if somebody's tense or nervous, a lot of folks come in nervous, especially when the story core, they think they're coming in to speak on the radio. And, you know, I just tell them straight out, like, no, no one is listening to this except you, the person you love, and me, and you never have to see me again. So a lot of time in an oral history, uh, I will just sit with somebody, um, and maybe we'll just talk for half an hour before I even turn on record, just so they're more relaxed. Uh, and then when I do hit record, it's just, you know, so tell me about your childhood. What was your mom like? And let them go and all those stories they know how to tell. And they'll warm up eventually, you know? Um, it's, uh, it's kind of like being at a party. I, this is a really bad analogy for me because I'm not really an extroverted person. So un unless I have a microphone, I don't really just chat up people's life. <laughs> but um, I imagine that extroverted people <laughs> do this all the time where they just, you know, so that's interesting. Tell me about that. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. So you can, uh, if someone's tense, if someone's not comfortable, let them talk um, about something they are comfortable with for a while. And don't do the critical engagement until they are comfortable. Save the critical engagement for something a little bit later. So it might be, if you're doing a multi-session oral history, it might be the second um, session before you ever engage with them. Um, I will say your engagement with them about certain pieces of memory and how that fits or doesn't fit with, with fact um, also is contextual. So I had, uh, I, I had a, a, a man come in who was talking with his grandchildren and he was talking about the, the riots that happened in 1968 in Atlanta after Martin Luther King was killed um, and how the mayor calmed everybody down by standing on a police car and so on. Um, and it just so happens I have a specialty in Atlanta history and I know for a fact there were no riots in 1968 that what he was thinking about were riots in 1965. The mayor didn't calm anyone down. The mayor stood on top of a police car and they flipped the car over and the mayor had to run away. So um, the question then became how or if I engage with this. If he's just talking to his grandkids about, you know, he was a mayor and what he was trying to say, he, he was a dentist. If he's just trying to say it was a turbulent time, I, I don't need to correct the record there, you know, not, not directly with him. I did in the notes on the database. But um, if he's talking to his kids about like the, the defining moment of his life is when this happened in 1968, and I know for a fact it didn't happen in 1968 or didn't happen at all, like he's saying, then maybe I will do that. But I wouldn't do it on the first try. I would do it when that person's much more relaxed and we have a bit of a relationship and where I could approach about, are you sure about that? Are you sure about that time? Okay. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Daniel. I think, I think we're just about out of time and, and there, there, uh, this was so interesting. It generated a lot of questions. Uh, there'll be more to answer, uh, after the, after the event, but, uh, but I think we'll have to, we'll have to wrap it up. So thank you very much, um, uh, Daniel for, for being here today and, and sharing this interesting webinar with us. Um, and so, I am just going to switch screens. Okay, so yes, um, in addition to Daniel, I would also like to thank all of our attendees. Uh, I also like to thank Joseph Nicholson and Eva Sorrell for providing technical support for today's webinar. The support they and their colleagues on the technical support subcommittee provide make it possible for us to present these webinars. I would also like to thank Alana Warren from the Alex office for her work in making this webinar a success. Finally, I would like to thank our Preservation Week partners, the Media Preserve, Archival Products, and Backstage Library Works. Thanks to their generosity, we were able to offer this webinar at no cost. We hope you found today's presentation useful and informative. You will soon receive a short online evaluation form along with the links to today's recording and slides. 
Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Your comments are very valuable and help the ELEX Continuing Education Committee improve its webinars and plan future events. Information about ELEX webinars can be found on the ELEX homepage. Please check out our web courses and upcoming e-forums. Suggestions for webinars and other CE opportunities are welcome at any time. You can contact any member of the ELEX CE Committee or submit a proposal for a webinar using the online form on the ELEX webpage under Online Learning. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, and we hope you will participate in other ELEX Continuing Education events and Preservation Week events in the future. This concludes our session.